Isaac Newton was born in Woolsthorp, England, to a modest family of farmers. From early childhood, he showed extraordinary curiosity about nature. Studying at Cambridge, he delved deeply into mathematics, physics, and astronomy, laying the foundation for revolutionary discoveries that forever changed science. Newton formulated the law of universal gravitation and the three laws of motion, uniting celestial mechanics and earthly physics into a single framework. He built the reflecting telescope and devised fluxions, the forerunner of modern calculus. Known for his reclusive nature and suspicion, he often clashed with peers and lived in solitude. Nature and nature's laws lay hid in night. God said, let Newton be, and all was light. This famous line captures his genius. Until his death, he led the Royal Society, reformed the mint, and became a symbol of the scientific revolution. Louis XII was born in Blois into a cadet branch of the Valois dynasty. He spent his childhood at court, received a military education, and was raised with the ideals of knightly honor. In his youth, he took part in plots and conflicts, but later ascended the throne as the father of the people. King Louis XII is remembered as a ruler who sought justice and simplified governance. He abolished many taxes imposed by his predecessors and became known as a defender of the peasantry. When the king spares his people, he strengthens the throne, he said. Louis initiated the Italian wars to claim France's rights to Milan and Naples, but faced strong opposition. His marriages were part of political alliances, including his union with Anne of Brittany. Under his rule, the royal court gained influence, and Louis's modest appearance and manner helped build his reputation as a king close to the people. His reign is seen as a step toward a more humane monarchy. Maria Theresa of Spain was born an infanta of the powerful Habsburg dynasty. From childhood, she was prepared for a dynastic marriage to secure political alliances. In 1660, she married Louis XIV of France, becoming queen consort and part of one of Europe's most famous unions. Life at the court of Louis XIV was hard. The king openly favored mistresses, while Maria Theresa stayed in the background, devoted to faith and raising children. Seen as virtuous yet powerless to sway her husband or politics. I am a queen, yet forever a prisoner at heart, contemporaries wrote of her quiet sorrow. Despite personal pain, her marriage forged dynastic peace between Spain and France, shaping European history and Versailles culture. Elizabeth Woodville was born into a noble family with Lancastrian ties. Her father, Richard Woodville, was made a baron, and her mother came from the ducal house of Luxembourg. A young widow with two children, she unexpectedly became the wife of King Edward IV, causing an uproar at court. As queen, Elizabeth brought her relatives to court, sparking jealousy and political intrigue. She endured her husband's deposition, exile, and restoration, followed by his death. She was the mother of the princes in the tower, whose fate remains a mystery. Later, she allied with the Tudors by marrying her daughter to Henry VII, uniting two rival houses. She weathered storms of war, loss, and court rivalry, while preserving her dignity and influence. Her final years were spent in seclusion at a convent. Hernan Cortes was born in Spain to a minor noble family. From early on, he dreamed of travel and fame. Though trained in law, he chose the path of a conquistador. His courage, determination, and boundless thirst for adventure brought him to the New World, where his legend began. In the New World, Cortes led the expedition that brought down the Aztec Empire. Rumors called him ruthless and cunning, yet even critics recognized his skill as a strategist. He said, victory goes not to the strongest, but to the most determined. His alliance with the Tlaxcalans, bold capture of Emperor Moctezuma, and the siege of Tenochtitlan became history. He died forgotten, but Cortes's name still sparks debate over the cost of conquest.
Talia d'Aragona was born in Florence, reportedly the daughter of a courtesan and a cardinal. From an early age, she was known for her sharp intellect, beauty, and eloquence. She received a classical education, wrote poetry, and mastered Latin and philosophy. A female thinker in an era when it was nearly impossible, Talia made her mark as a poet, philosopher, and intellectual. She defended women's right to love, reason, and self-expression, engaging in philosophical dialogues with Italy's leading minds. In her treatise on the immortality of the soul, she spoke not only as a writer, but as an equal. I don't need to cover my thought with a crinoline, she wrote. Her salons drew poets and scholars, and her image continued to inspire artists and writers after her death. Her life stands as a rare example of female self-assertion in Renaissance Italy, where a woman's voice was seldom heard so strongly. Jean Calvin was born in France to a notary's family. He received an excellent education, studying law and theology. In his youth, he embraced Reformation ideas that shaped his path. His scholarship, resolve, and stern character made Calvin a significant figure in European history. In Geneva, Calvin created a strict church system that shaped daily life through discipline and morals. His doctrine of predestination divided minds. Some saw it as liberation, others as a burden. He said, the human heart is a factory of idols, pointing to human nature. His Institutes of the Christian Religion became a cornerstone of Protestantism, and the Calvinist's austere life and work ethic later influenced Europe's development. Heredin Barbarossa was born on the island of Lesbos to a father of Albanian or Greek origin and a local woman. With his brother Aruj, he began as a traitor and later turned to piracy. After Arud's death, he carried on their work, becoming a naval commander of the Ottoman Empire. Barbarossa became the greatest admiral of his time, bringing the coasts of Algeria, Tunisia, and Tripoli under Ottoman control. His name struck fear in Europe. He attacked Rome, fought the fleets of Spain and Genoa, and his red beard became legend. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, he rose to Grand Admiral and led brilliant campaigns in the Western Mediterranean. I am the Lord of the Seas, and the waves are my subjects, he said. He died in Istanbul at an old age, surrounded by glory. His tomb became a symbol of Ottoman naval power, and to this day, Turkish sailors salute him. Anne of Brittany was born into the ruling ducal family of Brittany. From an early age, she became central to European politics, pursued by powerful rulers wanting to claim Brittany. Twice crowned Queen Consort of France, she married Charles VIII and then Louis XII. Anne's life balanced the burdens of a duchess and the power of a queen. Fiercely loyal to Brittany, she defended its autonomy even from the French throne. She was admired for her sharp mind, love of the arts, and quiet strength. Legends claim she wore Brittany's emblem beneath royal robes as a secret vow. The crown is heavy, yet my heart stays in Brittany, she was said to confess. After her death, Brittany was absorbed into France, but Anne remained a symbol of pride and resilience. Sequoia was born into the Cherokee tribe in what would later become Tennessee. His father was a white trader, his mother Cherokee. He became a blacksmith and silversmith, lost a leg, but not his spirit. Though illiterate, he dreamed of giving his people a written language. Sequoia created the world's first syllabary for his native Cherokee language. It was a cultural revolution. Within years, literacy in the tribe became widespread. He was called a prophet and a wizard admired by some, feared by others. He traveled across lands, promoting literacy for other native peoples. I gave my people a weapon that does not rust, he said. At the end of his life, he dreamed of uniting native nations, but died on the road. Trees, towns, and even a spacecraft were named after him. 
His name became a symbol of the power of language and spirit. Elizabeth Charlotte of Bourbon Orleans was born in France to the Duke of Orleans and a Palatine princess. From a young age, she lived at the Versailles court amid the splendor and intrigues of Louis XIV's era. Well educated, she became known for her lively mind and independence, setting her apart at court. As Duchess of Lorraine, Elizabeth Charlotte shaped the court's cultural life, supporting artists and musicians. Her letters to her daughter reveal a world of women's thoughts and feelings. I prefer truth, even when it is bitter. Rumors linked her to secret intrigues and political alliances, yet contemporaries praised her kindness and skill in compromise. She passed away, remembered as a woman of firm spirit and gentle heart. Maria Amalia of Saxony was born in Dresden to Elector Augustus III and Maria Josepha of Austria. Her upbringing combined devout Catholic piety with a brilliant education. At 16, she married the future King of Spain, Charles III. As Queen of Naples and Sicily, Maria Amalia was not merely the monarch's consort, but an active figure in court and cultural life. She supported Charles's reforms, took part in architectural projects, and patronized the sciences and arts. The royal couple lived in harmony, and Amelia had a strong influence on her husband's political and aesthetic decisions. She was called the queen of taste and reason, a rare blend of dignity and sensibility. She died at 36 in Madrid, leaving behind the image of an ideal enlightenment queen. Gazina Terbor was born into an artist family in Deventer, Netherlands. Her brother, Gerard Terbor, became an acclaimed master, while Gazina proved herself a skilled draftswoman. Her albums combine portraits, daily life scenes, and poetry, reflecting the atmosphere of the Dutch Golden Age. Gazina never exhibited her works in her lifetime, viewing them as personal. Her drawings radiate tenderness and attention to detail. Women's portraits, loving gazes, delicate clothing lines. She whispered, each stroke carries a heartbeat while sketching. Her albums open a window into private life of the 17th century, where simple joys, friendship, and poetry stand beside the era's grand events. Today, Gesine Terbor is called the unseen muse of Dutch art. Redbird was born into the Winnebago tribe in Wisconsin. From youth, he showed courage and thoughtfulness, gaining recognition among his people. In the early 19th century, he rose as a chief, striving to defend sacred lands and traditions against the tide of settlers. In 1827, Red Bird led the Winnebago Uprising, hoping to end oppression and reclaim what had been lost. His act was seen as desperate dignity he surrendered himself to save his people from bloodshed. I came to die, he told the judge. Falling ill, he died in prison, yet his memory endures as a symbol of resilience and resistance. In an early 20th century illustration, Red Bird wears a traditional headdress, his serious gaze fixed toward eternity, as if guarding his people's spirit and hopes. In legend, his name echoes as a reminder of freedom's cost. Christian IV was born into the noble house of Wittelsbach in Palatinate's Weibrucken. He was raised with the ideals of enlightened monarchy. The young prince was prepared for a military and administrative career and received a classical education, typical of German rulers in the 18th century. As Duke, Christian IV focused on improving agriculture and the economy, supporting Enlightenment-inspired reforms. He reformed the legal system and strengthened regional finances. 
His court was known for intellectual refinement and gentle diplomacy. My strength lies in prudence, not in iron, he said. He maintained a steady policy and avoided conflicts, raising Zweibrücken's prestige. His portrait reveals reserved pride and cool courtesy, traits respected by his contemporaries.